started. Hello, everybody. Thanks so much for coming. Um, my name is Katie Schofield. I'm the adult services assistant here at McFarland Public Library. Um, we are so honored to have Sean Miller with us tonight. Sean is an avid McFarland birder who leads bird walks each year for the bird festival. He has observed over 1,100 birds across the world. Sean participates in the yearly Great Wisconsin Birdathon fundraiser not only to get his birding on, but to also raise funds for the McFarland Bird Festival and the causes it supports. So, thanks, Sean. I'll okay. Thank you guys for inviting me tonight. We're going to learn about McFarland birding hotspots. Uh, it'll be mostly me talking, but I, a little bit I want you guys to talk to and we'll do some Q&A at the end and, and stuff like that. So here we go. Um, just a couple administrative things. First, we do have the Bird Festival coming up a week from Saturday, May 11th. It'll be from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. at the Lewis Park Shelter. I think most people know where that is, down by Lower Mud Lake there. We're going to have all kinds of tables and exhibits. I heard a rumor there's going to be a live turkey vulture there again this year. So. Yeah, come on down and visit us. We'll be uh, doing a couple bird walks uh, that morning as well. We usually go out about 9.30, take a group up to Indian Mound School Forest, and then we'll come back at about 11, do a second group then too. So. I, I do think there are a couple spots available in the guided walks. So oh, during the week, yes. Yeah. Yep, we have some walks coming up uh, during the week, Monday uh, at 7 a.m. at Indian Mound, and also Friday at Indian Mound. So we're going to meet in the back corner uh, on Yahara Drive and Indian Mound Drive because it's a little bit of a mess you might have seen on the front corner there with the uh, construction going on. So um, the other thing uh, that was mentioned earlier, I'm just going to hand these out if you guys can take one and pass it on. We do have a birdathon going for the uh, Bird Festival fundraiser and that's going to be this Saturday myself and one of my friends, uh, Alex Arnold. We're gonna go around McFarland and we're gonna see as many birds as we can see. We kind of limit ourselves to like the McFarland School District map, whatever that is. So the village itself and then some of the other areas, you know, that feed into the schools here. And we'll go around and uh, to different hot spots and some other little places too. And we'll see as many species as we can get. That's the goal is to tally up the highest number of species possible. And it would be great if people could consider donating. I know many people in this room already have donated, so I thank you for that. And many people probably watching have donated as well. Uh, we've been able to do some awesome projects over the years. Last year's Birdathon fundraising went towards these awesome birding backpacks that you can now check out, yep, at the McFarland Library here. And if anyone's interested what they contain, they have, of course, a couple guides, field guides. Um, about the different birds you can see in Wisconsin. And they have an adult pair of binoculars and a kids, we'll call them a kids pair of binoculars, but certainly they'd work fine for adults too. Uh, and they can be checked out. I'm not sure how long you know each checkout is good for, but it, I think at least a couple of weeks. So if you check one out, you can go check out the hotspots and, and really see what's going on if you're just getting into birding. So I think there's maybe four of these kits available. This is modeled off a program. Uh, that one of the bird clubs did uh, for Madison Public Libraries a couple years ago and has been pretty successful. So the more the merrier, feel free to, to grab one of those. Um, also on the screen here, uh, our first fundraiser we did was actually for the telescope system that's down, some of you may have seen at Lewis Park on the platform down there. Uh, those are like industrial grade telescopes that can withstand weather and a little bit of you know wear and tear and abuse. Uh, they can be uh, they don't need coins like some of the old ones, if you guys remember those. We're used to at little tourist places you had to put a quarter in. These are just free. You just walk up and use them. Really, to me, the best time is anywhere from like October through March. Uh, that water always stays open at Lewis Park. We'll talk about that a little bit in the presentation here. And it's a great hot spot to look at waterfall. Now, most of the stuff's cleared out. It's a lot of mallards and geese and stuff, but it can get really interesting there in the, uh, in the wintertime. And then, um, a couple of years after we did that, we raised money for a nice interpretive sign at the uh, Lewis Park Shelter that kind of is right before the viewing platform so that when people walk out and use the telescopes or their binoculars, they know what they're going to see out there, or at least have a little bit of an idea of what they're going to see. Uh, we highlighted the swans 
on our interpretive sign because we're, I'd say, like somewhat famous in the birding community for always having tundra swans out there in the winter. It's one of the few places in Wisconsin you can see them all winter long. And then, of course, we highlighted a lot of the other waterfowl there on the sign. So, again, your guys' generous donations uh, have helped us really fund all these great projects over the years. And this next year, what we're trying to do uh, for this year is get a second Purple Martin house going. Um, we have the one right next to the viewing platform. We're trying to get another one actually started out uh, on the prairie closer to the uh, marsh woods that's just a little bit east of the viewing platform. <clears throat> Purple Martins uh, are a species in decline in the United States. All the ones in the eastern U.S. used to nest in tree cavities like little woodpecker holes and broken off branches, but Long ago, they learned to nest in these house-like structures, and now that's kind of all they nest in. So they really depend on things like this to uh, find a good, suitable home to keep out the house sparrows and some of the other invasive species so they can reproduce. Beautiful bird. Took that picture at Fish Camp a couple years ago outside of one of their houses. So again, if you uh, are able to support or those wa watching home, that would be fantastic. And thank you already for those that have. All right. so. This presentation about hotspots, I know you guys have been waiting all spring for this, and uh, hopefully we'll deliver. Uh, you'll understand kind of what a hotspot is, kind of what that term means, uh, you know, in the birding lexicon. We'll talk about maybe what makes a good hotspot for birding. And then, of course, what we're here to do is talk about what are some of the good birding hotspots in McFarland. Um, I'll try and get you a little exposure on using eBird, the website, using their little hotspot feature, how to dial in. I'll go. I've got some screenshots, but I was telling our staff here, I'm hoping I can kind of do it live too on the website and just have you guys watch, watch what's going on. All right, so um, what we'll do is we'll do background and definition first on hotspots. We'll go through just kind of a raw list of the hotspots in McFarland, and then we'll kind of talk about what the top ones are out of all those. And then we'll do that eBird demonstration, then we'll have Q&A as well. And we don't have to wait to the end. If you have a question, just pop a hand up or something, and we can try and answer those as we go, too. So, all right, any questions before we get started? Okay, what is a birding hotspot? So, um, a hotspot is, is a term that is generated, at least my familiarity with it, is through the website eBird. And eBird is a data collection program run by Cornell University out of New York State. Uh, they, they use that to gather information about birds, the location of birds, quantities that are being seen, and uh, they freely share that data uh, with new data-driven approaches to science, conservation, and education. So what's in it for us as users are all these great tools, you know, free apps for listing your birds, for identifying your birds through Merlin, um, looking at your own data, looking at other people's data, what's in it for them, so to speak, as a research institution is, wow, now they've got people just gathering all this data. I used to say all over the United States, now it's literally all over the world that all this great information is being gathered. They use it themselves, but they also allow other institutions to come in and download the data set for whatever's needed and put it to good use, especially for conservation efforts. So great program overall. And so what they define a hotspot uh, as is a public birding location created by eBird users. And hotspots allow multiple birders to kind of enter their data into one same shared location. And that allows you to create aggregated results, so like totals. And what that really means is if a lot of people are recording birds at the same place, let's shove all that together and have it pinpointed so people can see it as kind of one spot on the map for data. And what this usually starts is uh, people you know, making what they call a personal location here and one there, and then all of a sudden there'll be a cluster of personal locations all kind of in this area that must be really good for birding, and somebody will scoop it up and kind of mush it all together and make it a public hotspot that people can just tag to in the future when they, you know, from that point forward. All right, so what, what makes a location a good hotspot? I mean, this is a s subjective thing, you know, it's, it's relative you know to how you view birding and and stuff like that but definitely one thing is public access uh, there are some hot spots that either historically have lost public access or or you know in the future might lose public access but generally you want to make a hot spot open to the public so people can go there on their own free time and look at birds and 
and checklist them right up to this data set. You want to have natural habitat. Um, certainly there are probably a few examples out there right in the middle of you know a city or something like that, but generally it's a place that's a park or a lake or a river or a prairie, somewhere that's got some natural habitat to attract the birds. Third, this is what makes a really good hotspot, mixed habitat. Um, when, when you go to you know, like Lewis Park, I think a lot of people just think of Lower Mud Lake there, but it's also got some marsh. And it's also got some woods, not only next to the platform there, but then a little further up at Lewis Park, or at um, Marsh Woods. And that's all kind of mushed into one hot spot called Lewis Park and Marsh Woods. So um, mixed habitat uh, brings a lot of different birds in. And ultimately, when you're, when you're trying to find birds, what you're really doing is looking in different habitats because different birds really are like this in this evolutionary niche in certain habitats. So the more mixed habitat you have, the more species you might find, and that'll escalate it up the hotspot list. And then, of course, like uniqueness, right? Like what's unique about a hotspot? What makes it really cool or really birdy, to use another birding term? You know, when you think about that, um, I, I guess, you know, in McFarland here, I think about Indian Mound Conservation Park, and we'll talk about that in a little bit here. What's unique about that? Well, it's right next to a river. It's right on a ridge line. There's a lot of trees in there. It really seems to trap a lot of birds in there during migration. Then it's just also generally birdie the rest of the year too. So each place has its own little thing. Um, you know, if, whether it's a prairie or maybe it's got a little sedge meadow in the, in the hot spot or something. So each, each hot spot can be unique and like the more uniqueness that's involved, usually the chances are for like some unique birds that'll go along with that, that like those types of habitats. All right, what are some McFarland area birding hotspots? That's why we're all here, right? So I would like to do a little group exercise here. If you all would feel comfortable, maybe just take in a couple minutes, find your neighbors there, and maybe just talk amongst yourselves. What are some places you guys like to go birding around here? Whether they're official hotspots or not, that doesn't matter. But maybe just talk amongst yourselves and then we'll come back and I'll ask you guys, you know, for your suggestions and we'll see how they match up to maybe what's on the eBird list. So this is called the turn and talk. So find a neighbor or a couple neighbors and just talk about some of the places you like to go birding around here. Okay, well, um, looks like there was a lot of good conversation going out there. So I just wanna maybe canvas the room a little bit here and, and see what people came up with for hotspot suggestions. Why don't we start in the back with uh, everybody's favorite former music teacher, Miss Larson, your group. What did you guys come up with in your group? Uh, well, we kind of talked about Marsh Woods. Marsh Woods, okay, yep, that's a great one. Right out your back door, mate, right? Yep, good, good. Okay, um, how about you guys up here? Well, I the boardwalk. Oh yeah, McDaniel Park on the Borock. What a great addition to our community. Yeah, that's a great time of year to see the ducks up close when the ice is kind of going out a little bit and they just all get channeled right in there. Oh, awesome. That's a great sound, isn't it? Like. You think you're up north when you hear that or something, and it's just little old McFarland here, here in the loons, so that's great. All right, did you guys have any other ones up here, or were you all kind of one big group? Well, Indian Mountain. Indian Mountain Conservation Park, yeah. Which, if you look on a map, is actually four different parks. It's McFarland School Forest, Indian Mountain Conservation Park, Thrun Marsh Park, and Jaeger Conservancy, all kind of mushed together there, but yeah. Colloquially, we just say Indian Mountain, right? Everybody knows what we mean. All right, Mr. Schneider, Mrs. Miller. Uh, in Sydney, I like the boardwalk. Um, boardwalk too. Yeah. I was just like McKinney that it's so impressive to see the pelicans. And they yes. Uh, I don't. I didn't believe that they were actually coming to until it's out there on the boardwalk. Yeah. I see them often. It's just amazing sight. You know, it's something I don't really remember from like my childhood, like seeing pelicans out in nature like that. So I think it's been a good recovery for them. How about you guys over here? Aside from uh, Marshall's Park, uh, this is not in McFarland, but the Nine Springs in UA. Oh, Nine Springs, uh, yes. Uh, Just there, across the lake. I was there about a week ago, and what's nice is those ponds are small. And yes. And real close to you, they're not in the middle of the lake. And aside from several ducks, uh, they're more a uh, 
pair of egrets and oh. several white dolphins and awesome. 75 feet of them. They're not skittish at all. Yeah. They're used to people, I think, out there. There's so many people that hike uh, the Nine Springs trails out by the Madison Sewage District. So that's a great place, great suggestion. All right, how about, what do we talk about over here, our group? <laughs> we, um, well, we also talked about Boardwalk. We boardwalk, boardwalk, yep. Boardwalk, but um, another great one that we went to visit a lot last spring was, um, I think it's the Grandview Pathway. Oh, yes. Probably, Grandview Conservancy, really, yes. The, yep. The Eagle Nest, the Eagle Nest was over Eagle there. Eagle Nest over there, yeah. yeah. Eating, far enough away where you would disturb them, but you could get a really close up view. And yeah, that's a neat area for yeah. sure, for sure. All right, these were all great uh, suggestions. I'm glad to hear people are out and about at these different places, and we're gonna talk in more detail about some of those uh, coming up. So, if you go to eBird, and you zoom in on a map of McFarland, um, it shows little pins, and the hotter the pins get, so like, think about like your like temperature, like cool is like ice, and then red is like hot fire. So, the hotter they get, you know, blue, to green, to yellow, to orange, we don't have a red one on here. What that simply means is how many species have been seen there. And they have a little gradient on the side that'll show, you know, when you're in red, it's like above 250 or something. And that's an all time calculation, so for all of time. And that can be a function of, you know, how diverse the hotspot is in terms of attracting different species, but it can also just be a function of how often people go there. The more people go to a place, the more weird things they see, and the higher that list gets kind of built up. So it's not an absolute truth, but it's, it's a good tool to kind of say like, oh, maybe not so great down here, but oh, this fish camp, this really must be a lot happening there. Uh, oh, the boardwalk, like you guys talked about. Wow, look at that one. It's only a couple of years old. That's already almost to an orange color. You know, it's accumulated a ton of species sightings already. And when you start clicking on these pins, what you get over on this screenshot to the right is little boxes will come up and it'll let you get into more detail. Now I clicked on them all just to kind of show what it would look like, but of course in real life you'll probably click on them one at a time uh, just to see what's going on. And eBird has a million different ways you can look at stuff. You can look at the data of all time. You can look at the data for this year. You can look at the data for this month, or maybe you want to peek ahead and say, show me every June what's been seen at this spot. So I kind of know what, what to expect. So there's a lot of different ways to parse the data, but just clicking on these pins kind of gets you started in doing that. So we'll go into that in a little bit more, maybe during our demonstration. All right. So here are the counts. If all those places that were on the map back there, and I'm kind of including fish camp because I feel like that feeds into our community right here. It's kind of right between us and Stone, but I think the kids that live out there generally go to McFarland schools. So fish camp County Park has the highest species count of any hotspot in the McFarland area, 203 species. Of course, they get a lot of waterfowl, a lot of ducks, things like that, but they also have a little bit of woods there. So then the next coming like a rocket ship the last few years here is the Lower Yahara River Trail. The, what we collectively called the boardwalk right out by McDaniel Park there. That's already got 199 species. That didn't even exist, you know, what was it, six or seven years ago? So that one's gone up really fast. Lower Mud Lake, uh, right out here, that has 197 species seen all time. Indian Mount Park, a couple of people mentioned that. Uh, very high list, 183 species, which is really a lot considering there's not like a lake there to add a bunch of waterfall. You get some on the river, but that's a lot of species. Lewis Park slash uh, Marsh Woods, that's combined into one hotspot. That's at 175. McDaniel Park just by itself is 169 species. So what people have seen right in the parking area there and probably looking out on the lake. Then our next group, uh, Orchard Hill slash the Urso Dog Park, that's kind of smushed into one hotspot. That's also new. I asked them to create that maybe five years ago because I was going out there a lot. And uh, now other people have started to go there too. And all together, we've seen 151 species there over the years. Babcock County Park, where everyone likes to launch their fishing boats from here in town. And there's a little campground there too. That's a really birdy area, uh, 145 species. Lake Wabisa itself, so just, you know, people tag stuff to the lake, whether they're looking from somewhere on the shore or maybe they're out boating or what have you, 142 species. Upper Mud Lake, 115. Yahara Hills Golf Course, I count that one too. It's really close to us. Uh, I think it's in our school district boundaries, even though it's a city of Madison course. We kind of just made that a hotspot this year because a few of us were 
I don't know if sneaking out there is the right term, but we were walking around out there after the golfing season ended and we saw a lot of different birds. We saw some crossbills, things like that, that were of note. So kind of tagged that as a public hotspot now. And then you guys mentioned the Grandview Conservancy. So someone just made that last year. They'd kind of carved that out as a hotspot separate from uh, the Orchard Hill slash dog park and stuff. So just by itself, it's up to 32. Uh, I'm guessing that'll grow as more and more people tag stuff to that uh, brand new hotspot. So that's kind of a high level look at what the different hotspots are and their rankings. And, and this doesn't this doesn't mean like, oh, Fish Camp is the best. That's number one. It's just it's just a way of kind of understanding how diverse stuff is at any particular spot and kind of how much, you know, how many how often people are going there. But if you if you think of it as like a tool, not an absolute answer, but as a tool, you come in here and you look and say, wow, these these places, they're really birdie. You know, they would be good places to check out if I want to go see some stuff, you know. All right, go to the next spot here. So the next few slides, I want to talk through some of the places. And if you guys have questions on how to get there or what we might see in a certain month, just feel free to, to raise your hand and we'll get them answered. So the first one I want to talk about is fish camps. It's, I'll, I'll go in order of how they were ranked and we'll kind of just do the top five or six. So fish camp, I think many of you know, is you just take highway AB out of town. It's a, considered a county park, uh, but there's parking there. There's a lot of boat launch people. I think you have to pay a fee to launch a boat, but there's another parking lot. You can go in out there and just park your car, or I think you can park along the access road. There is, um, of course, the lake there, Lake Higanza gets a lot of waterfowl. They get loons too. I think kind of like 130 there a couple weeks ago, just one scan across the lake with my telescope. It was just crazy how many loons there were. Uh, there's a big marsh right there. So if you look, um, the boat launch is here. If you look up in here, there's a big marsh up there and you get a lot of blackbirds. There's actually an eagle's nest out in that marsh on a couple of little oak trees that are sitting way out there in the distance. There's uh, usually an osprey nest around there. Uh, this last winter we saw a short-eared owl flying around kind of right at dusk, which is pretty neat. A boardwalk. So I don't know how many people know this or have been out to fish camp lately, but there's another boardwalk coming. They are building a boardwalk and it's almost done. Um, that'll go from fish camp towards, really towards Springers, almost all the way to Lake Higanza State Park. I think the boardwalk itself will end as they get closer to Springers, and then there'll be a groomed, probably asphalt trail that'll take you all the way through Lake Higanza State Park from there. So the wonderful thing that we've seen happen in McFarland on the northwest end is now gonna happen on the southeast end too. This one is gonna go pretty much through the marsh. There are a few stands of trees that you'll pass through as well. Uh, but one thing that's really neat is you kind of can get closer to that lake shore too as on parts of that boardwalk, boardwalk and see some of the ducks up a lot closer than just standing at the boat launch, which is kind of your only option right now. So what do we see there? Well, we see all kinds of waterfowl, ducks, grebes, uh, loons we talked about. Uh, we see passerines and passerine is just a term for all the perching birds, like the songbirds. So there's a lot of, in this time of year, there's a lot of warblers out there. There's woodpeckers on some of the trees that are still out there. There's blackbirds. We see lots of swallows. I was out there last night. I think there was about 3,000 swallows working out the parking lot over the lake. Um, it was kind of colder. There was bugs, or like must have been right on the lake service. So there was just swarms and swarms of swallows. It was, it was like one of those nature videos, you know. Uh, eagles and osprey, we kind of talked about that. There's a eagle's nest out in the marsh. There's an osprey nest on the power pole that's there every year and they reuse it every year. There are gulls in the winter. I don't know if it's just my personal, you know, idea of a good time to go out when it's 10 degrees outside and look at the gulls at fish camp, but uh, they do get some interesting gulls out there once in a while. They, you kind of have your standard herring gulls and ring bill gulls, but once in a while there'll be a lesser black back gull or a Iceland gull or something like that sitting in the ice shelf, you know, with the hordes of other gulls. So a really interesting place. And it's about to become, a, to me, a lot more accessible with that boardwalk going in. So I don't know what they're going to do for parking out there. I think I don't see another parking lot going in. I feel like it's going to be a desirable place and they're probably going to have to figure out what to do. So any questions about fish camp? Yes, Mr. Schneider. It's on the board, but they do want to connect the bike path. From yes, yes, how to connect here to there without going on the crunchy roads, right? Yeah, and I'm not sure that's eminent, but yeah, it is. If you 
there's usually some maps posted, right? And you see the little dashed lines of what the future projects are. That'll be really neat. OK, we'll uh, look at some pictures here that we see at fish camp. There's pelicans out there usually, too. I, I wouldn't say they stay all summer. They kind of start to trickle out you know, mid-May towards Memorial Day, and then they're off to wherever they're going for good. And same for the ones on, on Upper Mud Lake. Uh, the Purple Martin, we looked at that photo before. They have a Purple Martin nest house right at the boat launch there. Very successful. Tree swallows, mentioned that before. Thousands of them out there right now. It'll be down to just a few pairs in a couple weeks, but that's really, if you want to see what migration's all about, go out there tonight at dusk or tomorrow night at dusk. You'll see thousands of swallows around there, and most will leave in a couple weeks. Uh, the osprey, very successful. I, I guess before my time as a birder, ospreys were really rare. They were part of the DDT, you know, catastrophe that happened across the country, and they were pretty rare in Dane County. They came back into the Stoughton area, I believe, maybe about 20 years ago, people said. And now there's nests, you know. I wouldn't say all over, but this part of the county seems to have a lot of nests, probably because we have the lakes and, you know, good access. Um, if there's been a nest there every year I've been birding on the power poles. And then on the bridge that takes Highway AB right over the creek inlet there, there's cliff swallows. So I know it's kind of hard to see, but they make these little muddy nests right on the bridge. And if you stand on the bridge, you'll just see them swooping. And this was taken, I think, when my wife and I were paddle boarding underneath the bridge, just quick put the phone up there, and they peek their little heads out at you and stuff like that. So yeah, it's kind of tough. You can see a few grainy heads picking up, peeking out there. So they're there right now. Uh, they're building those mud nests as we speak and they'll probably have babies in a few weeks and then they'll be gone by like August. So they're in and out pretty quick. It seems like it's such, like it's based on a dare for all those babies. <laughs> <laughs> like, see that, like, you get one chance to fly, right? <laughs> they're really pushing it. Yeah. Right, right, good point, yeah. Okay, so that's fish camp. Uh, oh, and swans too. These are a pair of trumpeter swans I saw out there a couple of years ago. So a little bit bigger than tundra swans, make like a bugling call. Another victim of the DDT stuff, but they've rebounded nicely in Horicon. You see a lot of them now. And I think it's one of these years we're going to have a breeding pair in Dane County. I think we're getting really close. There was some suspicious activity a little further down last year into June by La Follette County Park, kind of on the Yahara down there. So maybe this will be the year. All right, next one, everybody's favorite, the Lower Yahara River Trail, the boardwalk. This one starts at McDaniel Park. It goes northwest. It's about exactly a mile, I think, from where you get on the boardwalk to where you get off if you go all the way. Um, what's nice about it, and we, we can't quite zoom in on this shot, but there is a nice, out by the trestle, there's a nice viewing platform where you can kind of step out of traffic for a little bit and just take a look at all the birds um, in a more peaceful way with all the bikes whizzing by and stuff. So that's nice. There's fishing access out there for people that like to fish. There's plenty of, well, I wouldn't say plenty of parking, but there's, there's adequate parking at, at uh, the parking lot at McDaniel Park there. So that's nice. Um, this one really warms my heart because so, I feel like so many parks are underutilized. Like you'll go out there and you'll be the only person at a state park or a county park hiking or something. But if you go to this boardwalk, there are people using it all the time. And that's great to see. I mean, what an asset for our community. People love to go on walks out there. They go on bike rides. And if you go during the week, people are like commuting to work. There are people younger than me that can have the energy to bike to work and back in Madison. You know, that's great that people are using it year round. They'll plow it in the winter even so people can keep biking and stuff. So uh, there is towards the uh, southeast end here, a stand of nice cottonwoods and uh, other trees like that. And you see a lot of like the warblers and Orioles and things like that this time of year. So you get a lot of nice birds out there too. So you've got the boardwalk itself. Yeah, the wooded lot we talked about right away. And then there's some dead trees in here which attract woodpeckers. There's another wooded lot that's kind of across the railroad tracks, but you can sometimes see some birds there. Uh, we got the marsh, which is kind of up in the corner of Mud Lake here. And that's where the pelicans like to hang out a lot, uh, uh, along with blackbirds. Some of the smaller ducks like uh, teal like to go in kind of muddy spots like that. Uh, we get lots of waterfall, of course, because we're by the lake. And like this gentleman talked about here, boy, when that like early March, when the ice breaks up a little bit, but hasn't gone out all the way, and you get all these ducks start coming, canvasbacks, redheads, common gold and I are still there from the winter, ringneck ducks, scalp, and they get concentrated. And you'll see thousands of ducks 
just right in front of you in these little little open areas that get created. And then two weeks later, all the ice is gone and they spread out and it's much harder to see stuff. But those two weeks are just golden. Passerines, again, the perching birds you're gonna see mostly in the wooded areas, swallows, eagles, osprey. I don't know of an active osprey nest right here on the boardwalk, but I feel like they are constantly fishing that area. I know there's a nest over by Nine Springs in one of the cell towers there. And I think there's a couple over by Wabisa Wetlands um, south of town here off uh, Mahoney Road. So, well, again, I don't see a nest. If you stay there an hour, you'll probably see an osprey fly by and, and grab a fish. Uh, gulls are great in the winter. Again, if you're really hardy and wanna, wanna go out there in the freezing cold and look for gulls out on the ice, a great spot. Uh, the gulls in the winter actually like to go to the landfill and feed all day on the garbage and stuff. And then at night, they want to go out on the ice because that's safer from predators. So they'll go stand on the edges of the ice. And they're kind of going back and forth all day long. So you might see nothing at 10 o'clock and you go back at 2 and there's more there. Or if you go at noon, there's some. But then you go at 3, there's different ones there. So it, it kind of turns over several times through the day. Uh, shorebirds, not right now, but like last year when the lake was so low, they created a lot of mud flats right next to the boardwalk, like where the riprap rocks are. And it got so muddy there that there was starting to be a lot of shorebirds there. There was yellow legs and different sandpipers and stuff like that. This year, I think that's going to be a tall order uh, with all the rain we've had lately, but that, that's okay. Uh, woodpeckers, yeah, they're all around. One area, though, if you're out there, those dead trees kind of in the middle of the two woodlots seem to have nesting red-headed woodpeckers. And those are the ones with the full red hood. They're really beautiful. That's a species that was in decline for a long time. Um, they seem to be coming back a little bit around the Madison area now. They're, I only used to know of like one pair at Lake Farm, and now there's one at Lake Farm, one there. There's a couple at Hog Island. So it's, it seems like they're reaching out a little bit more, and that's a great spot. You can see them there, and then they float around. You'll see them sometimes in the other wooded areas too, but I'm pretty sure they're nesting in those dead trees. That's, yes, sir. That's red-headed, not red-bellied? Correct. Yeah, there's lots of red-bellieds out there, but there are a few red-headed with those full red hoods beautiful black and white wings, stark white body. It's really a gorgeous bird. Good question. Okay, um, just some photos. These are a pair of bufflehead, male and female ducks that are here primarily in the winter. I think the last few are kind of hanging on right now. They'll nest further north, even outside of Wisconsin. But usually you can see a lot of those out there in the winter. Uh, this was a long-tailed duck that I saw out there this January. That I, the water under the bridge itself, there's enough current there, well, that'll stay open no matter what. Even if it gets to minus 30 around here, that little spot will stay open. And so when it did get really cold this winter, I went out there just to see, well, what's gonna be in here? Sometimes all the winter ducks will just concentrate right in there. And there was a little female long-tailed duck sitting out there swimming. And, and there was so little open water, she just swimming under the bridge right next to you. And you could take these amazing pictures. So that's considered a rare duck. It's usually like a seafaring duck that you would see like up in the Arctic Ocean. They do migrate to like the Gulf of Mexico, but usually where they see them is like in the big, like the Great Lakes, like Lake Michigan and stuff. So it's cool that we, we've gotten a few over, you know, at the boardwalk over the years. Um, cool looking duck. This is a hooded merganser. This will be a, a bird that has a chance to stay there and actually breed. Um, he's not quite in his full regalia. He'll take that little white spot on his uh, back of his neck there and he'll actually flare it up to like a quarter circle. So it'll be like this nice pie-shaped white marking. Really cool looking bird. When we had the shorebird habitat, we actually ran into a flock of uh, what are called ruddy turnstones out there a couple of years ago. There was about 20 of them flying around. Most years I'm lucky if I see one or two in Dane County. And right at the end of May, there was this whole flock of like 20 ruddy turnstones that were there for three or four days. So this year that won't happen because the water's too high. But as soon as you change that habitat, the birds that have their niche, they, they seem to come find it, you know. And then again, swallows. So this, this I took, I think, in August. Yeah, because there's more leaves out. And what happens is uh, after the swallows are kind of done nesting on the bridges and you know, other places, they kind of start to slowly migrate. And in the mornings, if you go out on the uh, boardwalk out there, you'll see little groups of mixed species of swallows sitting on some of the tree limbs. So I know we can't get enough detail here. Most of these are tree swallows, but there were a couple bank swallows in there, which are ones that don't breed here and are just kind of migrating through. They wear like little tuxedo bow ties across their white breasts, so it's a little easier to identify them. 
There was ruffling swallows. There was like three or four species of swallows just on that tree. Usually they're out flying around high in the sky over the water, but if you go in the morning, maybe on like a cooler, you know, fall morning, you can get them lined up before the bugs get active and they start feeding. Kind of a neat experience. All right, any questions about the boardwalk? I think everyone's familiar with that one. Okay. Oh, and a Baltimore Oriole. Lots of those out there up high in the cottonwoods and stuff. So they're singing right now. All right, Lower Mud Lake. So this, this one I want to talk about it like the Lewis Park section and the Marshwood section and kind of everything in between. So I'm not sure how familiar people are with that. I think probably a lot of people know Lewis Park. You drive up, there's the shelter there. There's, there's some parking spots there. Um, also though, and it's not connected by a trail, I'll say yet. I think they're maybe working on doing something to connect it with the trail. There is kind of a mode path you could take right now, but your boots would get pretty wet. So most people like me just take the little bike path and then walk on Marshwoods Drive. And there's a public access, I think on Johnson Street, uh, where you can park a couple cars there and walk out into some trails on the prairie, which eventually take you to a nice loop through this oak and mixed woodlands out there. And the loop actually gets pretty close to the lakeshore too. So sometimes you can sneak up on some of the ducks and get good looks there. Uh, that woods can be very, very birdy if the bugs are hatching and the winds are blowing the right way. A lot of birds can get clustered in there. Um, some of that land is private land. I think there's, there's probably a fence that goes through maybe a third of it, and that's the May Hunt land that's private land to the east. Um, but just that general clustering of trees attracts a lot of birds in there. So in this, this area, this lower mud lake hotspot, you know, Lewis Park, marsh woods, you obviously have the lake, you know, lower mud lake, it's a shallow lake, uh, but you still get good concentrations of waterfall. We saw the pictures of the tundra swans before. That's again, a unique thing. They migrate from like the Northwest, like Alaska to the East coast, like the lower East coast. So they're, that diagonal line goes right through our part of the country and a few hundred of them stay here. Nowhere else in, in really South Wisconsin, Southern Wisconsin do those tundra swans stay consistently over the winter like that. And even like on Lake Mendota, a few will make it till like the lake freezes over, but as soon as it freezes over, they come here because there's a little bit of open water that they can go in and feed. This water will stay open, not the whole thing, but a, a good channel of it will stay open all winter, no matter how cold it gets. There's just enough current going through there. And in the birding community, I'll say, like this is a known spot for people from outside of even Dane County to come and if they just want to get some winter birding in and there's nowhere else interesting to go, they'll come up here and go to Lewis Park and look at our ducks and stuff over the winter. So it's kind of a known thing in Southern Wisconsin that this is really a unique place. We have the marsh, which is mostly just, you know, right along the shore there by the platform. And there's other marsh across the way that you can see from the platform. And of course, then there's big swaths of marsh further out. But um, marsh adjacent to the lake helps bring in some different birds. The viewing platform itself is pretty cool. You know, you can go out there with a pair of binoculars usually and see a few things. If you have a telescope, you can see even more. Uh, and then we talked about the marsh woods itself is really kind of a, what they'll call like a migrant trap. So when migration's going on, the, the, it's just a term that's loosely used to talk about places that seem to attract a lot of birds. Like it's a little trap. The birds are flying and they're like, oh, there's a good woods right there. Let's go down there. And there's a bunch of midges hatching, flying around and they just, feast up, you know, and get their energy back. So it's a good migrant trap. In terms of what do we expect to see here? Yep, common theme, waterfowl, tundra swans are the unique thing here over the winter. Pelicans, there's little groups of pelicans on that lake, uh, at least again through the end of May. Passerines, especially in the marsh woods, you get warblers, you get flycatchers, you get sparrows, you get woodpeckers, you get all the different families of passerine birds in there. Um, swallows, yeah, same as the other places. You get a lot of different types of swallows. Eagles and ospreys, so there is, I think most people know, there is an eagle nest really close to here in the Grandview Conservancy, kind of in the uh, woods over here. Um, there actually was that same nesting, I believe that nesting pair has been here since I've been birding, which is about 2004, uh, when I first went and looked at those eagles. So I'd say about 20 years they've been nesting here. At the time, I'd say that was one of the few nests in Dane County that I was even aware of. Now there are several nests, you know, within a five mile radius, there's probably five or six nests. So that pair has moved their nest from time to time. And I think that's natural for eagles as, 
as you can imagine, try piling a bunch of dead fish in your house year after year. It's not going to be pretty, right? So they pile those dead fish in there. It gets really kind of gross. And after a while, they just have to abandon ship and start a new nest. One of the years, I think for about three years, they nested inside the marsh woods here, like right, do you remember that? Right above the trail. You could go on the loop. They had one nest for two years, and they built a second nest uh, for a year. I know at least one of the years they definitely had a successful hatching of eaglets in there. Now, after that, they've kind of moved back over to this Grandview Conservancy in the May Hunt area. So that's a really cool thing about there. Uh, Osprey, again, I, I don't see any nests right there, but they're constantly hunting this uh, parcel. Gulls, again, you can see some cool gulls out there. Uh, shorebirds, if it gets... The water never gets super low here, but if you just work these edges along by the marsh woods, you even on some of the, the algae mats, kind of the scummy stuff that are sitting out there, you'll see a few shorebirds walking around this time of the year now through, I'd say, Memorial Day, if you just go out there, even with a pair of binoculars. Yes, we got a question. Yeah. Yes. And it will loop back to the left back of the prairie. But where it starts to loop back, there's an obvious trail about 50 feet right down the water. You know, yes, like right in this area, right? Yeah, it's yep. quite, a, quite a different view from, uh, compared to Lewis Park. Yeah, you can get right into the cattails basically and right kind of be careful and stand on top of a few folded over ones. No, it's not that bad. It's right there? Yeah. Yeah, he's talking about there's a little cut through, uh, like a spur off the main loop, right when it gets really close to the water, right before it starts to turn back along the fence line. Yep, yep, that's a good spot where you can sneak up on the ducks and stuff like that and get a little better views. Okay, great comment. Any other questions, comments? Or else it's picture time. All right. Um, Turkey vulture. This vulture was sitting in a ditch eating something that was dead right on the walk from Lewis Park over to Marsh Woods. Kind of a hideous looking creature, don't you think? <laughs> uh, purple martin box. You know, it's uh, been there for as many years as I remember at the uh, Lewis Park shelter. Yellow warblers, you see a lot of those. Uh, they like kind of wet, scrubby areas where we have a lot of that in this hot spot. Sandhill cranes, you see a lot of sandhill cranes flying over this area. You hear them squawking from out in the marsh. Um, sometimes in the fall, they'll accumulate in little groups before they migrate. Maybe 50 will be out there in the marsh. So that can be interesting. Also, uh, we, just live, we just live a few miles up from that area, and the sandhill cranes will walk down the street and very hard. <laughs> right, right. Eagles, if you uh, sit down there, you'll see the pair come by. Now the mom's on the nest right now, I think. And they're probably taking turns feeding the eaglets. Um, but you'll see, you'll see that adult pair out hunting together. I think as these eaglets get bigger, they'll start to leave the nest together and hunt together. So fun fact about eagles and actually most raptors, the females are bigger. So if you see a bigger eagle and a smaller eagle, the, the mom is the bigger one. So, and if you see their bills, they really have bigger, deeper, thicker bills too. So uh, then in the winter, if you're down there out on the ice, Sometimes you'll see not only our resident ones, but some of the migrant ones where the lakes are frozen up north and they can't stay there. So you'll see four, five, six, seven, eight eagles just sitting out on the ice or perched in trees just in one day when you're out there. Pretty cool sight. This is a palm warbler. So this is something that would be out there right now. And they can be in the woods. They can be out on the prairie. Um, they're a beautiful little bird. They nest like the furthest south they would nest is northern Wisconsin. Then they go up through Canada and nest too. Uh, they like to nest on spruce bogs. But this time of year, they're kind of all over. They're the only warbler that pumps its tail. So if you see a little warbler flicking its tail and pumping its tail around, a little rusty cap, yellow throat, yellow butt, that's a palm warbler. I remember that because it's like a palm leaf. There you go, palm leaf. I like that, palm leaf, palm warbler. OK, any questions about Mud Lake area? Definitely a hot spot for McFarland, a real gem. All right, Indian Mound Park. So again, it's kind of four parks together, but we're just going to call it Indian Mound Park. Uh, the habitat here is really great. There's an oak wood lot, and it's low, and it goes up a hill and gets higher too. So there's a, a difference in elevation, which can bring sometimes a little bit different birds. Uh, there's a marsh right in the middle there, the Thrun Marsh. Uh, you don't have real good access to it, but you kind of have some trails around the edges, so you do get to see some of the birds that are from the marsh. 
You have the Yahar River on the back side here. It's what's known as Jaeger Park, so you have access to there. Um, this is, again, a really, even in Dane County, like the Dane County birding scene, all the cool birders, they all know Indian Mound is like a really good migrant trap. And it's, it's no surprise that a lot of good birds have been found there over the years, a lot of rare birds. So uh, warblers, if you walk down there, well, hopefully this week on our bird walks, uh, next Monday and Friday, we'll see lots of warblers. If it's a good day, you could see 15, 16 species of warblers just in one walk. Uh, there's different vireos that go through there, flycatchers, woodpeckers. There are owls there. I remember on one of the bird walks a couple years ago, we saw great horned owls out there. Um, I have had screech owls there at night, you know, kind of in the winter when they're doing their little screech owl thing. Um, I don't know if I've ever had a barred owl in there, but it wouldn't surprise me if there's one floating around somewhere. So just a good, really good place. And it's, it's not like you have to hike 10 miles. It's really just a small compact area. The hardest part is probably going up the hill and back. But even by the water tower, there's lots of good birds up there. It's really you know, dense forest, especially looking west down towards the houses there. There's just a lot of good birds moving around there. And if the wind's blowing one direction, the nice thing about this park, no matter which way the wind's coming, you can hike to a part of the park that's got calmer winds. You know, that hill will shield it from one side or the other. And then if you get down to the other spot, you'll say, oh, this is where all the birds have been hiding. You know, the birds are there, but they don't like wind. They, they like, they'd rather have rain than wind. So they don't like being in the wind. They have to expend a lot more energy. It's all about calories. How much can they eat versus how much energy they have to expend. So they'll find areas that are calm and they'll just kind of slowly trickle into these spots that are out of the wind. So if you can kind of just figure out which spots, you call it the leeward side, you know, windward, leeward, like in Hawaii. If you can find the leeward spots, then you'll find some of those birds, even on a windy day. All right, some pictures from Indian Mound, Rosebreasted Grosbeak. This was on our birding walk last year. We had that wonderful day where we saw like 10 or 12 Grosbeaks in one morning out in the forest. This is a magnolia warbler. So this is one of the migrant warblers. They'll come through here and then they'll nest up in northern Wisconsin. Beautiful little guy. This is a least flycatcher. Now this may stay here. Some of them will keep going, but some will stay. This is a scarlet tanager, one of my personal favorite birds. Bright red bird with jet black wings. Um, I would say they, they don't typically stay here. Maybe in bigger woods in Dane County, like uh, the Arboretum, or another place might be Picnic Point, or maybe out like Dane County is a little bit of Blue Mountain State Park out there on the Iowa County border. Like there, I would expect to see them at least one or two in the summer breeding. In McFarland, we just get them for a few weeks as they pass through and they're really gorgeous birds. It's our only expected tanager species uh, in this part of the, well, in this part, like the Midwest. So if you go further south in the Eastern US, you can see summer tanager. If you go in the western U.S., you get summer and western tanager. If you go to Costa Rica, then you go out one spot and there's like 24 species of tanagers. So, what did you say the one for the tanager? Yeah, this, great question. This is called a least flycatcher, and it's part of a small group of flycatchers called Impidimax is the name of the family. Empids for short. They all kind of look alike, and you kind of have to hear them vocalize. There are some minor like field mark differences, eye ring, no eye ring, um, wing length, stuff like that, where you can kind of pick them apart a little bit. But even when you split them like that, some of them are still so close together, you actually have to hear them vocalize and they make different vocalizations depending on the species. So they can be tough to identify if they're not vocalizing. Um, just looking at this, I would say, yeah, it's probably a least, maybe a yellow-bellied flycatcher. Luckily, I had marked my photo that it was a least, so I must have heard it, you know, at the right time of year, making it sounds. Actually, I had one of these in my yard today, so just going chunk, 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 like that. So, this is a white-throated sparrow. We see them crawling around the ground this time of year. They get here end of uh, April. You might see them in your backyards even, uh, if you just pay attention last week, this week, maybe even into next week. They'll start to disappear after next week. They'll nest in like dark forest areas in northern Wisconsin and Canada. Uh, beautiful little guy though, white throat, so appropriately named. They got a little white crown on top too, and they have little yellow lures that connect their eye to the bill. Kind of a chunky sparrow. They like to pick through the leaves. They'll perch up maybe mid-level, but you'll never really see them like at the tops of trees like a song sparrow. 
And this here looks like a pine. No, it's a yellow-throated vireo, I think. So they, uh, this is one of the species that actually will stay uh, in the forest. A vireo has a little thicker bill than a warbler. So here's a warbler bill. It's like a little spear, a little knife, sharp, good for lancing insects and pulling caterpillars out of you know, leaves and stuff. This is a vireo. So it's got a little bit thicker bill, not quite like a finch, but a little thicker than a warbler. So they can maybe not get in as many crevices, but they can crunch some bigger like beetles and caterpillars and things like that. Yeah, it's hard. If we zoomed in, you'd actually see a little hook on the top mandible that goes over for ripping caterpillars apart and stuff. The bird world's a violent world out there. Everybody's trying to eat something, you know? So these are birds, again, some you find in migration, that one, that one, and that one, and then some might be there all year round, like the grosbeak, the flycatcher, and the yellow-throated vireo. So, neat place. And I, I put a plug in for my daughter's Girl Scout troop. They went and put interpretive signs in a few years ago in the forest there. Uh, a lot of them just talk about plant species, but some are like raptors, and you can put your phone up to it and scan it, and it'll tell you about the different raptors that are seen there. And we actually have a songboard right where all the trails intersect of like 20 different birds with their pictures, and then like on your handouts there, the little QR code, if you scan it with your phone, it'll play the song on your phone of the bird that's pictured there. So you can kind of understand what the songs are like. All right, any, I guess any questions about Indian Mountain before we go on to our, our next one? All right, Orchard Hill slash the dog park slash like all these DNR and county fields that are out there. This is a hot spot. Uh, I asked eBird to create a couple years ago because I was walking my dog out there a lot. I was seeing a lot of birds and I kind of wanted to encourage more people to get out there. I thought this is really a great place. You know, you've got the spruce trees. So if you go in where the uh, disc golf course is, you know, there's all those giant spruce and pine trees there. Those can get some unique birds. There's lots of wooded areas. Um, even though they've cleared out a lot of the underbrush for the golf course, there's lots of wooded areas. Even just walking in the dog park, there's usually lots of birds around there. Uh, even with all those dogs running around, there just seems to be birds everywhere. And then if you take these prairie trails, there's a big loop around the main prairie. There's one that cuts through. There's loops around the lower prairies down here. There's woodcocks in there. If we went out there right now, you know, at sunset, we'd probably hear some woodcocks, maybe even see them flying up in the air doing their little aerial displays. So here's a, here's a situation where you have oak woodlot, you have prairie, you have conifer stands, you have some swamp that's kind of hidden right in the middle between the dog park and the woods in there. There's a little trail that's not obvious that goes back there, but there's a little swamp back there and you can sometimes see some unique birds back there. So you get all these different habitats and voila, you get tons of different types of birds. You get good quantities of birds. They're pretty good about taking care of those prairies. I think they burned the main one uh, this year again. So again, this becomes a big migrant trap. The woodcock are probably the most unique thing. If you go out end of March, um, sometimes even end of February with all the warm winters we've been having. So sometime between, I'll just say early March and mid-March, you'll start to see and hear woodcocks out here at dusk. Uh, lots of sparrows, you know, out in the prairie areas there. There's song sparrows, field sparrows. Uh, in the woods there can be, you know, during migration, white-throated sparrows, white-crowned sparrows on the edges. Lots of warblers, especially in that main wooded area there. Vireos, flycatchers, woodpeckers, owls. I know there's a, all three owl types are there. Uh, great horned owl, I see once in a while out in like these pine stands out here that are just across from that little two spot parking area at the end of Hidden Farm Road. Uh, barred owls definitely nest in the main woods here and sometimes you'll see them venture out more towards the parking area where the spruce trees are, but they definitely, if you're out there like listening for the woodcocks, all of a sudden you'll hear the woo-hoo, woo-hoo, the barred owl doing its call from inside the woods there. And then I have had screech owls there too. We put a, we put a box out here and I haven't seen them nest in it, but I might not just be there at the right time, but I know they're kind of around this area in here. There's some pair of screech owls. So this one's a, a little bit off the beaten path. You gotta go on the, you know, well now it's paved up to the disc golf, disc golf but then it's a gravel road and you end up at, eventually at somebody's private property, but there's a little parking spot kind of near the end of the road there where you can just access the prairies directly. So cool spot. I like it a lot. You can hike probably five miles if you want on all the trails out there. So there's a sneaky amount of good trail action out there. Um, and we've been getting some good birds there the last few years. So any questions about this area? 
All right, let's look at all the cool photos. So there's a woodcock. It's kind of my grainy nighttime holding a flashlight up with one hand and trying to take a picture with another. They're walking around through the prairies. They do these aerial displays, but eventually they'll go nest in the woods and that's where they get their name from. It's actually considered a shorebird, if you can believe it. Another palm warbler, they love the little scrubby habitats out there. Uh, bluebirds, there's a couple nesting pairs of bluebirds out there. There, were, there are at the marsh woods in that prairie as well. Yeah, red crossbills. I think on the video we recorded a couple years ago when we did the bird walk, right after we turned the cameras off, this rare red crossbill came and landed in the conifer stands up there. So, uh, and then this winter, right at the end of winter, I think the flock broke up that was at the golf course and like 12 or 15 ended up in those conifers for like a week or so, uh, maybe even two weeks. People were seeing them up there and there was males that are red, the females and immature birds are kind of this uh, yellow greenish color. If we zoomed in, they really do have a crossed bill and that's for prying open the pine cones and the spruce cones and then they stick their tongue in there and grab the seed out while it's kind of pried open. So it's a cool bird. Blue gray gnat catcher. This is a common bird you'd expect to find now in any kind of scrubby or wooded area. Uh, almost like the size of a chickadee, but a little skinnier, like a long tail. They make little whining sounds as they're working through the area. This is a blue gray gnat catcher. And then the screech owl. Yeah, that was taken out there a few years ago. So, All right, this is the part. I, I know we got just a few minutes left, but I did want to give a quick demonstra demonstration of how to look at these on the internet, on eBird. So you would click on eBird, then you'd click on the explore button, and then you'd get to this page here and you'd click on a explore hotspots. Okay, and I'll, I'll walk through this in real time too, but it, these screenshots will be, you know, if people look at the presentation afterwards, they can kind of follow along. That'll bring you to this screen. And oh my gosh, here's all these pins, millions of pins. So you gotta start zooming in, right? You gotta. You can type in either the hotspot name directly, like I want to learn about marsh woods and it'll bring a drop down and you, you hit the thing. Or you can say, I just want to like zoom me into Dane County. You can do that. Or you could say zoom tool and you just kind of make a box around there. Or you can just scroll your mouse. So there's like four or five different ways to do it. But you can get to the area where you want to dig a little deeper. You can also set the, again, the date and how many years you want to look at for data. So if you just want like, just tell me about the last five years. You can set it like from 2019 to 2024. And you can say, I just want to learn about the winter birds. Set me from November to December, something like that. So you can parse the data however you want. You start zooming in and then you get to these pins and that's kind of like we looked at earlier in the presentation and you click on those pins. Yep. Remember this screenshot? So you explore the McFarland area, you click on a pin, this one for Indian Mound, you hit view details and now it'll take you to the page for the Indian Mound hotspot. It'll show you the species that have been seen there. And if you want to see them all, you just tap all and it kind of expands the list. It'll show you any photos that have been uploaded recently. It'll show you like people's actual individual checklists that have been submitted there. So like, okay, what did Sean Miller see? He saw eight species on April 25th at 5.16 PM. But Andy Polios, he's a much better birder. He saw 21 species the day before at 8.21 AM. So, you can go through and you can just kind of see what's being seen recently. So, um, you can get to some really detailed stuff too, like bar charts that show the frequencies. You can see who's the top eBirder at each hotspot, you know, and stuff like that. So it's kind of fun too. So I know we answered some questions along the way. Are there any general or specific questions about hotspots in general or McFarland areas? I didn't touch on that whole list from McFarland. You guys don't have enough. We, we'd be here way longer than you'd want to be here. But um, I just kind of hit about the top five or so. But there's certainly, you know, other areas to be explored in McFarland that are full of good birds. So, yes, question. I know you had uh, rose-breasted grosbeaks. Uh, yes. Are there evening grosbeaks? That oh, that's a good question. I think these days I'll say that is a very rare bird for Dane County and usually only in the winter or the months surrounding winter. I've talked to older birders that said 30, 40 years ago, they'd have them at their feeders all winter long, emptying the sunflower seeds. But that's a species that's in a big population decline where they typically nest would be like in the boreal forest of Canada, a few nest in Northern Wisconsin. And so I'd think 
the populations have crashed, so we just don't really get any anymore for migration. It's a, it's a rare thing when one shows up. I've never seen one in Dane County. Good question, though. Yep, beautiful bird. Oh, yes, we have a question over here. So it was one day like, at school, there was just a bald eagle that came and landed on like the turf area of the track. Really? And it just, it was crazy. It was really cool to see it like that. That's cool. But it looks like it was eating something. Ah. Why did it choose to go there to eat? Maybe. Like so it already had something you think in its talons? Yeah, it looked and like it just landed on the there. Turf eating. So uh, that's a good question. I guess we never really know. But one a situation I could imagine is that. It's a wide open space. It can keep an eye on other predators that might be coming to steal its food. So maybe that's a situation where it just, it was sick of flying around. It's like, I'm gonna pick the first open area to land where I can keep an eye on things and chow down this fish. Now bald eagles, I know we all see the magnificent pictures of them swooping through the water and grabbing a fish. 90% of their diet's eating like roadkill or frozen fish that die and get trapped in the ice, stuff like that. So. That could have been something that scavenged right off the road, like a dead squirrel or something that got run over and just landed in the field to eat it. So good question. All right, any other questions? Can I ask Yes, another question. Yep. So last year was a really bad year for avian flu. Yes. So is that kind of typical? Like I was expecting a lot more this year, but it didn't. I don't know much about that. Yeah, I read some of those same stories last year. I think we did end up with a couple maybe dead pelicans out around in this area somewhere. Um, I know in northern Wisconsin, they had a big problem with like the Caspian terns that nest around Door County. Like the whole thing got basically wiped out, one of the nesting colonies. So I haven't heard as much chatter about it this year. I don't know if that's because it's old news or if there's just not as many cases this year. So hopefully it's behind us. But uh, yeah, that was a big catastrophe, the avian flu last year for some species anyway. Good question. All right, other comments, questions? If not, thanks for coming. And uh, yep, appreciate you guys coming out. And uh, yep, again, we got our birdathon going on. So support us if you can, if you haven't already. And uh, hope to see you out there birding somewhere in McFarland. Thank you very much.